Hello, Maxime. Thank you so much for joining me on the Well Vegan Travel Podcast today. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yes, I'm really pleased to have you on because you have got a lot of travel experience and uh, things to share with our listeners. I would love it if you wouldn't mind sharing with our listeners what it is that you do in the vegan space. Yeah, thank you. I coach people to improve their body composition on a whole food plant-based lifestyle. So we don't use any form of like fake vegan products. We primarily focus on whole foods and we include some strength training, resistance training, cardiovascular exercise. So people can be their fittest, healthiest self and it can carry that forward for the rest of their life. And ultimately with the purpose of helping them reduce their risk of dealing with chronic illnesses, you know, like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and all that. How long have you been doing that? For over four years now. Okay. And how's it going? Great. We've helped over 800 people in 20 different countries. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing. All right. So if someone were to sign up for these programs, because I've done a couple of these things in the past and they look kind of lots of different ways. So... What might that look like as a client of yours if I was traveling a lot? Yeah, great question. So we're not like any other transformation program out there where you come in and they gave you a coach and that's pretty much who you're gonna be working with. When you work with us, you get a full health team. So you actually get a doctor, you get a nutritionist and you get a trainer and you get an accountability coach. You have three or four people working on your transformation when you come in. We'll get you to do your blood work wherever you're at in the world. We'll get you to do your DEXA scan to get started for, based off the results of the blood work. We can tell if there's any deficiencies, depending on which country you live in. I know some food might not be accessible because we work with people in 20 different countries. They're like, hey, I don't have this food here. <laughs> we'll make adjustments from there. And then you have your trainer. Hey, basically get a full health team working on you. And if you're traveling, we're going to make adjustments on whether you're in a hotel room, whether you're in the Airbnb, whether you're camping on the side of... Kilimanjaro as you're hiking up. So it's all tailored to the environment that you're in constantly. Wow, that sounds really interesting. I'm excited to learn more about it for sure. Maxine, you are speaking to me from LA, correct? Yes. But you are not originally from there, right? No, I'm from <laughs> everywhere, but I'm originally from Canada. <laughs> okay, so since you grew up, where have you lived or traveled around? Yeah, so I grew up in Quebec. Canada, so on the east side. I grew up in deep winter. Since then, I've lived in Alberta. I lived in BC, like five minutes from your house, which I learned after <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when we got connected. I've lived in Tulum, Mexico. I lived in Merida in Mexico as well. I lived in Milan, Italy. I lived in Germany. I lived in New York. Obviously, Los Angeles. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it so far. Sure. That's a lot of places, Maxime. I think you and I have a lot in common in this regard. So something I'm curious about, what was it that kind of made you start this lifestyle where you were just traveling so much and decided to live in lots of different places? Yeah, the truthful answer is I can't stay put. <laughs> I think that's a, I that's a real answer. I know. My parents didn't really travel. Maybe one trip a year and it was like a road trip. We didn't really have the funds to fly anywhere or do cruises or do any of those things. We didn't really get to explore the world that much. And then when I was old enough to make those decisions on my own, I could see the path that the people around me were heading on in my small town. And I was just like, I can already see the next 60 years of my life. And this, this isn't resonating with me. I want more. I don't know what it is, but I just want more. I sold everything and pretty much hitchhiked across Canada and ended up in Alberta. I just knew that if I took a different path than everyone else, I would end up having a different outcome than everyone else. And I didn't want the outcome that they wanted. That's what led me to go in this complete opposite direction. I traveled that way because I didn't have money. You know, I was 18 when I did that. I sold everything and I just left. So because I didn't have any funds, I didn't want money to stop me from traveling. So hitchhiking was the way to go. And I did that for, man, I'm almost gotten like over 200 rides. That's amazing. Also, when you were quite young and maybe didn't have a lot of street smarts yet, how is that for you? And is it something you would consider doing now you're a little bit older and wiser? I have money now, so I wouldn't do it. But <laughs> right. I like a nice plane. I like flying places. If I had to, I would have no fear of doing it. I only had great experiences. I've gone almost over 200 rides and only had great experiences. Mind you, I'm six foot four, 200 pounds. I'm a male. The odds were in my favor that I would be safer. But what was very surprising is a lot of women picked me up. I would say maybe 95% that were giving me rides were women. 
Some of them told me they found me cute. That's why they picked me up. <laughs> they didn't want to make sure that I was okay. Um, but yeah, honestly, only had great experiences. I hitchhiking, met some amazing people, accomplishing incredible things. Just that chose different path of life. One guy was in the movie industry, quit that, became a pilot. And he created an app that when you drive through the Rockies in Alberta, as you're driving, it would grab your location and tell you, if you look on the right, there's this mountain and this is the history of it. When he picked me up, he was testing his software. And so I got to learn the whole way through with him, got to ride in his plane. I've only met great people. I really love that. And I think that's something that often happens when we travel, particularly when we're a bit younger and we want to travel more cheaply. So that means hitchhiking or staying in hostels or going on public transportation. You just meet people that you wouldn't necessarily meet when you're in your small little circle. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, as long as you look mm. clean, you smell good, you're probably going to have a good time. <laughs> I love it. So out of all of the places that you uh, mentioned that you've lived in, what are some of the things that you really loved about living in those places? Yeah, I, I really loved living in, in Italy. That was awesome. Just the culture, the lifestyle. It was the pace of life was a lot slower. And there was Sempione Park. I would go there and play basketball. I was there for a modeling contract, but I just got to like connect with awesome people, play basketball and just live that little Italian lifestyle. Mexico was great. I still want to move back to Mexico. I'm working on convincing mm, my wife. Too. I just love the lifestyle of you just wear flip-flops and shorts and I'm just shirtless all the time. You can go in grocery stores or whatever. And it's just like, the, again, it's easier pace of life. It's more calm. It's more quiet. Those have been two of my favorite spots. Everywhere where people don't care about dressing a certain way or having to have status and where it's a slower pace of life like that's my jam I'm always going to have a good time there I love it so when were you living in Milan because I went there recently and it's actually quite vegan friendly now yeah I was over a decade ago when I had my contract over there I just remember Milan it was getting commercial so there was a lot of all you can eat sushi everywhere and so I'd have like the sweet potato and the cucumber sushi and all that but that was pretty much my only options at the time and do you have any interesting stories or anecdotes from your travels of living in these places? Yeah. One that I like to say is I was staying at a friend's house in Montreal. And one day I woke up and I was like, I want a new tattoo. And so he started practicing doing tattoos and then he tattooed me on my forearm. And yeah, he, did, he basically did a compass and a mountain. And then the next day I was like, you know what? I want to go to upstate New York. I've never been before. So I go to the train station and I tell the lady, close your eyes, put your finger on the map, and I want a ticket to there. And then she closed her eyes, put her finger on the map. I was like, great, that's where I'm going. So I had my big off-spray backpack with my tent and everything with me. I end up in this town and it was like a ghost town. It was like Saturday at 3 p.m. and all the stores were closed. There was only one corner store that was open. Like I couldn't find anything. And then I just looked up. I found the biggest mountain I could find. It's, it's like a big mountain near Lake Placid. And I think it's like the Adirondack mm -hmm. National Park, one of the biggest mountains. I want to go sleep on that mountain. And so I started hitchhiking. I told the person where I wanted to go. They drove me there and I got there. It was like 11 at night and it was pitch black. He dropped oh. me at the end of a road in the pitch black. I ended up camping there, putting up my tent in the dark. I was scared because I know there's bears up there. The next day, took the wrong road back down and ended up on a really small road and no car drove there for four hours. I was just walking and then eventually there's a little Jeep that was driving and I pretty much jumped in front of it. And poor her, it was like a young girl, maybe like 18. And I'm like, hey, Yikes. I'm <laughs> stuck. Can you give me a ride to the nearest town? And she was like, ah, I don't know. I was like, I've been walking for four hours. Anyway, she gave me a ride. Um, ended up in Lake Placid in upstate New York. Mm -hmm where they do the Iron Man. I'd never been there before, beautiful place. When I got there, I don't have money to stay anywhere. And so I was like, you know what? I'll just stay up all night at the McDonald's because usually they're open 24 hours. And then I was like, I can just stay there and have a shelter. Because the next day I had a, a train ticket to come back home. I only gave myself a few days to be there. And I go to McDonald's and I was just gonna sit in the corner and drink water. I learned that it closes at 11. And I have nowhere to sleep. So I start walking around the streets. I was trying to look for a park or somewhere where I could camp. Nothing. And so I couldn't afford a hotel room either. So I was like, you know what? I got nothing to lose right now. I'm just going to go knock on doors with people that have big backyards and see if I can camp in their backyard. 
It honestly was such a great experience. I knock on the first door. I was like, hey, I just explained, I'm, I'm traveling. I don't have money. I was going to plan on camping, but I got stuck and ended up here. Can I camp in your backyard? You guys have a big backyard. They're like, oh yeah, of course, come on in. And they invite me to their house. They fed me, they gave me food. And they told me, hey, we own a store, an outdoor store. So basically like a mom and pop shop of REI or MEC in Canada. They own an outdoor store. They're like, hey, you can just sleep in there. It's heated. There's sleeping bags, Wi-Fi and everything. So they literally drove me to their store, opened the store, let me sleep in there all night with all of the gear there. And yeah, I was, that's what I was going to say when you yeah. <laughs> trusted you with all of the gear. <laughs> they just had a great energy. So they let me sleep yeah. in their store. And the next day, I think several hours before I got to grab my train. And I was like, hey, how can I repay you guys? I obviously don't have money, but you have like labor that you need to do around here. And so I painted the front of their store. I raked the leaves in the back. I helped to clean up some stuff, mm -hmm. kept in touch with them. Phenomenal people. Honestly, that's like what, one of my best experiences of just knocking on a stranger's door at 11 at night, trying to sleep in their backyard. So this is very interesting to me. And I think a lot of people would balk at doing something like that. Well, my parents did for too. For a number of reasons. <laughs> yeah. So what sort of traits do you have that you've developed that made you so comfortable with doing something where there was a bit of a risk in that you could have been eaten by a bear or you may have ended up having to sleep in the park. I mean, these are things that really most people don't want to ever risk ending up having to do. So it sounds like you've cultivated personality and attitude mentality where you are prepared to take that risk. Yeah, I never saw it as a, a risk. It was more, my parents were like strict with me. And so the things that I wanted to do a lot of times I couldn't do. So when I got to the age that I could do what I wanted to do, I was like, there's no one that's going to tell me that I can't do something. And that rebellious mm -hmm. energy has served me well in my life, <laughs> has allowed me to put myself in a great position. But back then it was like, if I want to do something, I'm going to do it. And the worst that's going to happen is someone's going to say no, and I'm in the same position. So honestly, I, as I'm sharing this, I recall a point where everything changed in my head that I could just ask for things. I used to work at a mm -hmm. subway when I was a teenager. I've always been a good worker, very productive, very efficient. And so I got promoted and my boss would always call me when someone was sick. And I would just say yes, because I wanted to help. I was just getting burnt out. I was just working all the time. And that's when it shifted for me. Yeah. yeah. I've had some similar experiences where I've taken risks. One story bubbles up in my mind. I was working in Morocco in 2005 as a tour leader and I had a few days off. I went to this little coastal town and on the way there on the bus, I got talking to this lovely woman and we just, just chit-chatting chit the whole time. When we arrived, she invited me to her house. Yeah. I was vegetarian then, I wasn't vegan. And she said, you, you could come and stay. I thought about it for a little while, wondered whether this was a good idea, but I ended up saying yes. I had such a wonderful experience. I ended up staying with her and her family for three days. Only she spoke French. Yeah. The rest of the family spoke Moroccan Arabic and we just communicated the best we could. I had so many wonderful experiences there. It was a very small house. We were yeah. all in one room. Um, you know, they would get up very early in the morning to pray. We had henna parties and they took me to the local beauty salon in Morocco. That's very much a women's space. Yeah. I went into the women's beauty salon and they did my makeup and hair. And of course, because it was in this women's space, they were just so raucous and laughing and joking. And it was just so fun to see this family and group of women having fun together. I would never have had that opportunity had I not risked it. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm. it, and it's like, I, I'll say this. When I was traveling, I, I got this nickname. It was Lucky. Oh. I originally, you probably saw it online if you're doing research on me, but I built this whole brand around Lucky Lifestyle, L-U-C-K-I-E. And I went by the name Lucky for eight years. And the whole basis around that name was that I was always lucky when I was traveling. What you put out there is what you get back. And so I was just putting out so much good energy that I just kept attracting the most amazing people and the most amazing opportunities. Mm -hmm. And obviously you have to trust your gut in certain scenarios, but a lot of the times good things tend to happen. 
Mm. And now you're living in Los Angeles. What has brought you there? Uh, my wife. <laughs> well, she's from. Yeah, she lives here, but she's originally born in, in the Philippines. She became here when she was 15. But yeah, I was living in Mexico and I met a now good friend of mine, Nimai Delgado, the vegan bodybuilder oh, yes. from Game Changers. So I met him there, became friends, and he was like, hey, come to LA. It's my girlfriend at the time, not his wife. It's her birthday party. And so I was like, you know what? I've been in Mexico long enough. Let me just go visit LA. I had never been before. And so I got rid of everything I had in my apartment in Mexico. And then I came to LA. And within maybe three weeks of being here, I was going to stay here for a little bit, explore, do all the touristy things. And I was going to go to Costa Rica because I had never been. But then I met my wife and then we started connecting. And I was like, oh, let's see where this goes. And now here we are, married almost three years later. Amazing. That's so cool. And now you're looking to settle there permanently. Is that right? No, no. I, I'm oh. going through the immigration process just so that we could both live in a country together for longer than six months and not have to move because we did that. I was here for a bit and then we had to go to Squamish, BC in Canada, but then she used up all her six months as a tourist. So then we had to go back to the United States and that's where we're at now. So we want to be able to live in the same country for a longer period of time than six months. But we both love traveling. She's done like 20, 30 different countries with her work. So we're both travel junkies. Wow, definitely a lot of crossover. Yes, I'm actually just about to get my, well, in, by the end of the year, I should be able to get my Canadian citizenship. And I'm really pleased about that because then at least Seb and I will have a shared citizenship. Yeah. Just, in, just in case things go wrong somewhere along the line. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. I'm just so enjoying this. I'd love to ask you, if you don't mind, if you would share some tips with our listeners on how they can maintain their physical fitness when they travel, whether it's for a short time or whether it's for a longer time. I know for me, I can be super, super consistent when I'm at home. And as soon as I do anything different, like I'm traveling, it just totally goes out the door. And then of course, the strong neural pathways that I have built up, they slowly start to become weaker and weaker. And then when I get back home, it is a real struggle to start working out again. Yeah. Are you able to share any insights on how people can stay fit when they travel? Yeah, of course. I just want to divide the two types of exercises. So there'd be cardiovascular exercise and resistance training. So cardiovascular would be you're going for a run, hiking, walking a lot, right? If you're doing a lot of sightseeing. And then your resistance training would be either going to a gym, doing body weight exercise, or going outside and doing some exercise. Because that will bring on benefits for bone density, lean muscle mass, metabolism optimization, and all of these things. So several ways. I'll, I'll put levels, and it's all dependent on the time you have and income. But now when I travel somewhere, I let you just pay for a day pass at a gym. Whenever I book a hotel, I look for a gym that's around it, that has what I need, and I'm just going to go and pay for a pass. So sometimes it's 20 bucks, sometimes it's 50 bucks for a day. Regardless of what the amount is, I'm always going to pay for a pass so I can get my workout in. Because I've learned for myself that if... I'm in this routine and it's a part of my life. And then I travel and I don't work out for a week. I feel terrible. I actually don't enjoy my vacation as much because I just start to feel weak and soft and pudgy. Usually you're eating better food when you're traveling. So I need to make sure that I get that workout. First, I pay for a day pass. Second, when I was traveling and I didn't have the funds, I would just say that I'm visiting and I would like to try the gym for free for a day to see if I want to sign up. So I go for those free day passes at the gym. Another one that I did is, honestly, I would just go to a park so that I can be outside and I just do body weight exercises while I'm out there, All right? Sometimes like a, a tree trunk or some rocks, do some curls, some shoulder presses, whatever. You can bring your own bands if you want to. And if I'm in a rush, I'll just do it at the hotel. Usually hotels have a gym or inside the hotel room. I'll just keep it really basic to full body type of workout. I'm not going to do anything crazy, but just to get the body moving and stay in the motion and the habit of it. Um, those are the different options that I chose, but right now I always, regardless of where I'm at, I'm always going to pay for a gym pass wherever I go for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a bit of a Peloton person and I have a subscription to that. And even though I have that incredible app with these amazing trainers that has a bazillion workouts, strength workout, workouts that include that equipment. I still find it really hard to do it. So it's there. I just need to make it happen. Yeah, so I, there's some sort of res a mental resistance there for sure. I just do it first thing in the morning. That Because I know that if I'm traveling and I want to go sightseeing and do different things, 
there's no way I'm going to stop midday to go do a workout and then shower and get ready again. First thing in the morning, I just get it out of the way and then I can enjoy the rest of my day knowing that I'm on track with what I want. Do you like to include some sort of like stretching, not necessarily yoga? Because I found, find that when I am traveling and sitting for long periods of time, I can get uh, extremely stiffer because I'm normally pretty stiff. Yeah. But is that something that you pay attention to also? Yeah, at the end of every workout, whether I'm traveling or not, I always do a nice mobility warm up and I'll do stretching after the workout. I'm always going to go to the gym and that's always going to include some mobility and some type of stretching. Fantastic. When you were sharing with me some of your adventures that you've done, you mentioned that you have actually done a rather long cycle trip as well. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I cycled from Vancouver, Canada, all the way to San Francisco to raise money for cancer patients. I was not a cyclist. I didn't really do okay. cardio like that. <laughs> I was more in the gym lifting weights. But my partner at the time, she was battling breast cancer. She oh. didn't come out publicly with it. It was within her first year of diagnosis. She decided to stay private. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't make enough money to pay for all the treatments. I have to do something crazy that would allow me to raise money. And I saw, I think it was James Lawrence. He did 50 Ironmans in 50 different days in 50 different states. I was like, I'm not going to do that because I can't leave for that long and I have a job. <laughs> so. I'll do something less crazy, but still crazy, which is cycle to San Francisco. I had the idea, I think in August, mid August, while she was doing some treatments and I was like, cool, we're doing this. So I started reaching out to companies, get some sponsor. I found a bike, I found a sponsor for food and I bought four panniers. Beginning of October, I left, I went to Vancouver Island and kind of just biked down from there through Washington. Yeah, it was a beautiful, crazy trip. Every night I camped somewhere i didn't have money for hotels or whatever because i was raising money for cancer patients and yeah i was able to raise money for five cancer patients one of them being my late partner and uh yeah it was a beautiful experience it was hard it was very challenging when i got to san francisco i was like i can keep going to mexico now but when i left oh my <laughs> god my legs my hip flexors were sore it took me 21 days or 22 days i was sore every single day there was not a day where my legs right. weren't stiff I love doing those kinds of physical trips. You know, they can be a really great impetus to really get fit and stronger. For example, we have a trip for Tanzania, for Kilimanjaro, that we, we have spoken about on the podcast that I recorded with you and offline as well. A lot of people that do these things, and myself included, we don't necessarily do a lot of training, but doing an event like that or some sort of challenge like that can really kickstart some things. I don't know whether you did, but it sounds like you could have developed like a lifelong love of cycling and just really got better at that. Well, funny enough, that's what got me into Ironman and triathlon, which I've done over 30 of them at this point. That trip was the beginning. Oh. That was cool. What can I do that's crazier? So I went on Google and I was like, what are the craziest events in Ironman? I didn't know what it was. I did not know what triathlon was. It's not a part of the community where I grew up. And I was like, okay, you're going to swim, bike, and run. I'm like, I hate running, but I guess I'll try it because it's a part of it. I'm not a swimmer. And yeah, that's what got me into that world. And now I have several medals. And <laughs> I think I finished like top 5% oh, in the yes. world for my age group when I was competing for half Ironman. Wow. Oh, do you confirm my theory? Amazing. All right. Because you've traveled so much, I would love it if you wouldn't mind sharing maybe a favorite a vegan place to eat in each destination. Maybe something that's a little bit off the beaten track, maybe not like the top rated on Happy Cow or something. That would be really nice. I love to share with our listeners these personal recommendations of fun vegan places to eat. Yeah, my wife and I just went to New York and obviously there's tons of great restaurants in New York. We didn't have a chance to do 11 Madison because that place is really booked. Yeah. But there was a place called, I believe it's called Anixi. <gasps> I was thinking about that yeah. when you said you were going to New York because I really want to go there. It, it is so good. I don't even have words to describe it. That was so delicious. That was such a great experience mm. of a meal. And when we went back a second time, it was a little bit on the pricier side, not 11 Madison pricey, but more than a traditional vegan restaurant, more than Crossroads, we'll put it that way. But yeah, it was so delicious. It's so flavorful. The texture was perfect. If they, if there was one here, I would be spending a thousand bucks a month just eating there for dinner every night. It was <laughs> delicious. I think he's a good one. I love when I was in Vancouver. I believe it's called Mila. Yeah. Love Mila. Great food there. That was really good. 
there's a classic in Vancouver, like Meat on Main. That's more like comfort oh, food. Yes. You can't go there all the time, but that's another good one. My partner would beg to differ there. <laughs> yeah. There's another one in Vancouver. It's called Vegan Pizza House. You ever heard of that one? Oh, yes. I don't think I've been. I think it's not downtown. No, South. Yeah, it's a little bit on the South. outside, but they have a... Yes. I'm one of those people that loves pineapple on a pizza. Okay, don't judge me. Me too. Okay, great. So it's like a ham and pineapple pizza. And it's mm -hmm. so good. They make their own vegan cheese. And one thing that I miss, oh. the only thing that I miss from being vegan is when I grew up, there was this pizza that the cheese was like stringy and melty. And I've just never mm. been able to find that <laughs> texture to it, that like squeakiness. They did a great job at it. It's all made in-house. So I think it's called Vegan Pizza House. I think it's on commercial. Drive. You said the word squeaky. Yeah. And you are from Quebec. Yeah. So that makes me think that maybe the cheese that you're talking about is a little bit like curds. Um, I grew up with poutine and curd cheese. And yeah, I've never been able to find a vegan version of that. That You just can't replicate that curd texture for vegan cheese, at least that I haven't found. But yeah, it doesn't have that kind of squeakiness, but just like a little bit mm -hmm. of it. The Got curd is it. like really, the whole thing is squeaky. squeaky. Yeah. I have tried curds before I was vegan and I had never seen anything like it in my entire life. And that squeakiness, it must sound strange yeah. to people listening, but that's the only adjective that you can use to it describe. Is. There is a vegan supply, which is the vegan grocery store yeah. in Vancouver. I don't know whether they still have it, but they do have a vegan cheese curd. It looks the part. Yeah. It doesn't have that squeakiness or the right texture. Yeah. <laughs> One day. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. The, the cheese has gone. We've we've come far from Daya's first version mm -hmm. <laughs> many years ago. We tell us about your favorites in Mexico. Yeah, Mexico. There's a lot. Uh, when I was in Tulum, there was a lot of good. Merida, it was more like you go to a restaurant and you get tacos without the meat and it's just sauteed veggies. So there's not any specific restaurants. But Tulum, there was maybe like five or six that were delicious. So there was the pitted date. I spent so much money mm -hmm. there. They <laughs> made waffles and pancakes that were so thick and rich and oh. Wow. I dream about those pancakes sometimes. They were so good. So I think I believe it's called the pitted date. S delicious. Every Saturday I would walk an hour to go there because I didn't have a scooter, but I'd walk an hour just to get my steps in and turn my pancakes. But yeah, that was delicious. Lilo was another one. Like whole food slash comfort food, but they had like a mm -hmm. drink. You ever had kava before? No. So kava is a, a root. There was a bar in Yelltown in Vancouver called Zen Lounge, and it was raw vegan. Mm -hmm. And they served that drink because it's like a social drink. It, it numbs your mouth a little bit and loosens you up, but it's not oh, al alcoholic. They, have some, they sometimes have like it in ceremonies, yes. like carver ceremonies and maybe some Pacific Islands or something. Yeah, yes. So yeah, they do have it in ceremonies, but basically it loosens you up. We'll just put it that way. There's another spot where if you're in Tulum and you're, I used to live in like old downtown Tulum and there's a Tulum Central and you can drive one straight road down and then you get to the beach where there's all the hotels and where all this stuff happens on the road down from central almost in front of the grocery store for the people that have been to tulum before there's a restaurant westphalia's like the good old volkswagen or saw that nice one so there's two of them there's a restaurant mm -hmm. in there and they have a whipped coffee drink it has coconut mm -hmm. flakes whipped coffee oat milk and some type of sweetener spend so much money there too that was every day i was like, so those are some of my favorite spot in, in tulu i have really enjoyed talking with you maxime and just having a chat about travel and how that has featured in your life and thank you for all of those amazing recommendations and advice as well i would love it if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit so maybe links and instagram and i you have a podcast too Please let us know all of the details so listeners can go and follow you and uh, check out the services that you offer. Thank you, Brady. First of all, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. It was great to talk about travels because it's not often that I get to talk about my crazy hitchhiking stories. It doesn't fall within the realm of fitness usually. So that was really fun to go down memory lane. The main places would just be fitvegancoaching.com. If you go on YouTube and you type fitvegan or my name, our YouTube channel will show up which our podcast is also posted on fit vegan podcast on apple and spotify and yeah my instagram is going to be linked on all those platforms it's just my name but yeah fitvegancoaching.com you'll find everything there 
Amazing. And I know you have to stay put for a while, but where is your next adventure going to take you? Actually, my wife and I are talking about getting rid of our apartment and just moving from Airbnb to Airbnb every month or so, just because I'm getting bored of being in the same place for so long. I, lo I love being in a new city and then it makes you want to explore around and go do the hikes and go do the whitewater rafting and all of these things because you're not going to be there for long. Versus when you live there, you're like, I will do it at one point. And then you move out and you're like, I never did these things. So yeah, we're I... thinking about it, bouncing around the United States until this immigration thing is done. I love it. I love it. That's so funny because again, that's something that Seb and I will be doing after our little kitty has left this earth. She's a little sick at the moment mm. and she's quite old. So we're wanting to spend lots of time with her, but we are doing something very similar after she has passed for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maxine, for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me.